What's cracking, like and dudes and dudettes? It's Ness, and you're watching NES Collectibles. Today, I've got a video about how to play a brand new card game, Earth Tau. Uh, so if you like the video, make sure to do the thing. Big shout out to the guys who make this. What a wonderful game. We're gonna start with the card types. There's three different type of cards in this game. So the first is the leader cards. The leader cards is a character that your deck is based off of. It is you as the player you are going to be this super. They have a special ability that can be triggered every turn, and they also have a global support value up in the top left of the card. There's a number of different leaders. You can get Smash and Grab versus Archfiend, and you can get Rock Salt versus Professor Paranormal. And there is a fifth leader that you can get out of the booster packs uh, if you happen to meet these guys uh, while out at like Fan Expo here in Denver. Um, they will be there, um, and that is Dr. Captain Man. The next card type is a location. The locations are pretty neat because of the fact that they are printed with the full art on the back of the card as well as on the front of the card. They actually have the ability facing both directions so when you're playing across the table from your opponent they can also read what the location says and does. Another neat thing about the locations is that the current storyline is based in Colorado and it's showcasing famous landmarks as well as local history that can be found in the art. The third and final type of card is assets. All of the assets have ability boxes. They have a rank and a card type. They also have different notable abilities. The assets can be either heroes, villains, professionals, events, or gadgets at this point. Lastly, one of the things to take note of with the assets is the highest rank is rank 7. Rank 7 are, is reserved for champions and they have a gold rank symbol and a wreath that signifies that they are a champion. Uh, these are the most powerful superheroes in the game and once one of them is placed into your team you're no longer allowed to naturally play any more assets into that team. Let's get into the game setup. So the first thing that you're probably going to need to do when you start a game is pick a format. Skirmish is the easiest format with one location. And then there is war, which is dependent on the number of players, and you're going to do the number of players plus one for the total number of locations. So for two people, that's going to be three. For three people, that's going to be four, uh, and so on. Next, you're going to pick a battle format when playing multiplayer. Anytime there's three or more players, you can do either King of the Hill or you can do a rotational format for deploying your different assets. Next, you will place your leader. You will grab a marker, which can be a token, a dice, a coin, something, something small enough to place on the card to be a reminder of where you played last turn. Next, you'll choose the locations. Um, there is a number of different ways you can choose the locations, but generally, if you're playing with two players, each player will supply three different locations and you'll choose randomly one of those six if it's a skirmish. If it's a war, each player will get to choose one location and the last is determined randomly from the leftover location pool. One thing of note here is that no duplication is allowed. So no location can be submitted by a leader more than once, and no location can be used more than once in a game, even if it's submitted by more than one leader. If two locations from the same leader are already chosen, then the third location must come from the other leader. Next, you'll determine the turn order. Uh, whatever leader has the lowest support value is going first. If there is a tie for the lowest support, the leader that has the fewest location cards will then become the person who starts the game. If that's still tied, then it's a high dice or high card check. Let's talk a little bit about the board state. So you're going to have a few different locations here on your board. You're going to have the location where your leader is. You're going to have your deck. You're going to have the location in between you and your opponent. And you are going to play vertically towards yourself as you lay down cards, and the same will be true of your opponent on the other side of the location. You'll also have a discard pile known as your retirement, and then there will also be a, an, a special area called your admin, which is going to be a team-like area underneath your leader. So anytime you have a card that you play to your admin, it will go underneath your leader and stick out to the side, and this will allow you to be able to count the additional support from the back of the card. Basic deck construction consists of having one leader card, three locations, and either 20 or 40 asset cards, depending on what format you're going to be playing. The limitations of building the deck state that you can only have up to three copies of the same card in any deck. To start the game, you're going to draw six cards. The play phases of this game are pretty simple. 
They generally start with a basic understanding of draw, play, and resolve. First, you will draw your card from the deck. Then, you may play one card to the location. If this is skirmish, you only have one location, or you can tuck to your admin. If you're playing in war, then obviously you have three different choices when playing a two-player game. When playing war, you're going to have three different choices of locations to play to based on the number of players. So for two players, there would be three locations. When you choose to play a card, you're going to announce that you are deploying them. So for example, I may be deploying Mr. Amazing using body. Instead of playing a card to a location, you can tuck or charge your card to your leader for additional support. This is done as a visual to specifically let the other player know that now your global support has increased. When playing a card to a location, it covers the cards previously there on that side of the location and only leaves the support visible. This is because only the top card of the opposing player's board is relevant when comparing ability scores for playability. This is also done to speed play and limit board evaluation time, and looking at previously played cards once covered is not allowed. After playing the card, you're going to resolve any effects in any order. So there's three different types of effects that can occur. There's a location effect, a leader effect, and the played cards effect. Specifically for the played cards, the asset cards as it were, halts are counter spells that can stop resolving those effects and can counter cards up to the rank of the halt. They don't stop the card from being played, but they can stop the power of the card being played. Using a halt card sends it to the discard pile known as the retirement pile. Cards retired during a turn for a cost are not accessible via the retired pile during that same phase. This is known as transit. Uh, any assets are removed from the board, deck, and hand, they do not immediately go to retirement or the lobby. They first must go to transit, lay them separately face up, assets go into transit in the same order that they were removed from play. At the end of each turn, all leaders will place the assets in transit into either the lobby or retired pile in the same order they were in transit. Every asset in transit is public information until it is moved to retired or lobbied. The game ends when a player cannot play a card to any location other than to tuck to the admin and they have already have a maximum support available or can't play to any location and tucked for the support the last turn. The player may also choose to end the game once maximum support is reached and a cyclical game state is confirmed. So what this means is that we have either a hard lock or a soft lock with the circumstances of being able to play a card. In hard lock, all your locations are blocked by champions or the deployment marker. There's literally nowhere else to play uh, in that basically you can assume that from a narrative standpoint, there's no more help coming and your team makes one final little push to accomplish their goals. For a soft lock, a situation is where there's no way for me to simply deploy a card from my hand. Um, there's no way for me to take a card from my hand and say I am playing here with the right amount of support and I am winning with. On the narrative side, this would be as if a character was coming up and saying, Commander, we have no reinforcements left. Do we charge with what we have or do we hope for a miracle? So basically this is a circumstance where someone cannot deploy into a team. It eventually happens that that leader will not be able to do it. And when this happens, the deployment section of the game ends and the aftermath begins. Now we can score the locations based on their scoring priority. Some guidelines about this include, if you can deploy into a location, then you must do so. If you can deploy, the game hasn't ended yet. If there is not a legal team to deploy into, you have to reveal your hand to your rivals to verify this. Admin does not count as a team. You can choose to deploy into admin if you would like the game to go on, but you do not have to. It is your choice. If you can somehow use an ability or deploy from somewhere other than your hand, you may choose to do so, but just like admin, you do not have to. Let's get into scoring points and winning the game. Once the game has officially ended and there's no more deploying of assets, you're gonna score the location. The location is scored based on the ability type pictured on the location. Most locations are scored on either body, aether, or mind, AKA BAM. There are special cases for specific locations. However, this will be determined on the card. When scoring, you'll sum up the points of the scoring ability for each card played face up. 
Then you'll add rank points from any power-ups that were played face down, and the player with the highest points wins the location. In Skirmish, only one location is played, and therefore, the player with the highest points wins the game. In War, the player with the most one locations is the winner. Ties currently can happen. If you also don't believe a tie should happen, I recommend a tiebreaker, either as choosing the highest rank played, or summing the rank points to determine a winner. So this is a little section that I'm going to call the Tome of Terminologies. There's a number of terms in this game that I think if we are able to replace the term with something that's a little more common, it's going to help bar this gate to entry, really. The team that has made this game has chosen very specific terms that mean things that we understand in the card game community that I think are very valuable. Um, to collect is to draw, so the, the specific terminology that they are using is once per turn you may take the top asset from your deck and place it in your hand. On top of that, you know, there's many abilities that have you collect extra cards, and to add to this, there is no hand limit in this game, so if you draw a lot, you get to keep all of them, unless another card tells you to drop some. There is also a very important relevant piece of information here. You do not lose the game if you are unable to draw. You just simply are only going to be able to play out of what, play with what's in your hand. If you get to the point where you have no cards in hand and no cards in deck, then technically you can't play and therefore the game would end. Deploy is placing an asset from your hand into one of your team's face up as part of your normal turn. This is when you're playing your card. You'll deploy it based on one of its three abilities. Next, there's drop. Uh, it is a common deployment ability that will force a leader to retire at, at random one card from their hand. Um, you may also see drop as part of larger abilities. Basically, this is a random discard from a player's hand. The next ability is Leech. It's a common ability that lets us retire assets directly from the top of our deck, so this is milling. Oracle allows you to look at a number of assets on the top of the deck and return them in any order. You can also look at the retired pile with this ability. So it's a little bit better than just kind of looking at the top four. Uh, Portal is a special targeted ability that allows you to move assets from one team to the top of another team. Portal is particularly relevant for multi-location games, um, otherwise you may only have access to your admin and the one location. Retired. This is when assets have been taken out of play and are considered retired because Death Nether seems to be permanent for superheroes, so at any time you may look through your retired assets, but you may not change the order of them in retirement. You may not look through your rival's retired assets except their top retired asset. But basically, this is just the discard pile. Transmute is a variable powered ability, and it lets you retrieve assets from your deck in exchange for retiring other assets from play. For example here, Professor Paranormal, he has the ability to transmute any time uh, he would collect. So when you draw, instead of looking at the card, you would say, okay, I'm going to transmute it. It's gonna go directly into the retirement slash discard pile and you're gonna look at the rank of that card, and then you can go fetch any card that is that rank or lower and actually make change with it as well. So let's say you get a six rank, you can, uh, that's gonna go directly into the discard pile, and then you can actually go tutor up, you know, a four and a two, or just a six, or, uh, you know, three ones and a three. Like, you can go find whatever cards you want based on that rank. So it's a very, very powerful ability. It's very interesting, um, but it is a blind trigger. So in other words, you don't know what that card's going to flip over as, and you must decide to transmute it before you see it. There are a number of mulligan rules that are special to this game. The first mulligan is always free, and then every mulligan after the first the, will allow the opponent players to search their deck for an asset card and place it in their admin. This is a free action, no turns are used, and D markers are left unmoved as well. So when you are forced to do a mulligan, if it is the third turn or sooner, um, and you are unable to play an asset from your hand, uh, you would then actually show that to your opponent, and you will place that hand aside, and you will collect seven new assets from your deck. If the hand is still not playable, then you will repeat the steps. If you have to mulligan enough that you get to the point where you can't collect seven assets, you do lose the game. And this is true for Skirmish, where you do have a smaller deck size. So take that into account when deck building. Once a hand can be kept, shuffle all side assets back into your deck and continue normally. 